Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me properly? Also in the back? Can you hear me well? Good. So let me take you on a journey through time. How did the world develop? Now let me start in 1800. Back then, life expectancy was 35 years and 85% of world population was living in extreme poverty. What was extreme poverty? How, how did we define it during the last few years? Less than two US dollars available income per day. Calculated in GDP, and what you can see here, that's the international declaration, how, how, what levels of income we have. Level one is extreme poverty, two, three, four, uh, this is how we look at development uh, on a global scale, at least the United Nations is doing it. So let me press the button and watch the bubbles go. How did we do? So this dump is World War I. And what you see here on the left, the pink bubble, the big one is China, the, the, the smaller one is India. Look how they are growing, how fast they're catching up. Today, uh, the average of the world population is living on level three, and only less than 10% is living in extreme poverty. That's a huge achievement. And most people don't know those numbers. But what did it do? When we look at GDP as a measure of how well we did, we have a large chunk of entropy. We have violence, crime, drugs, energy, waste, damage. Why do people break into other people's home to steal things? We have health-related issues. And when we add that up, at least in 2004, that was the guess from Professor Nefyodov, we had 40% of global GDP entropy. This was destroying wealth, not creating wealth. So when we have 100% and we have 40% destroying wealth, and we all pay for that. Did we do well? So what is entropy? The cost of entropy is violence, crime, drugs, social costs, etc. cetera. Okay? And health related also has, a, 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 has two directions. One is when we take care of our health actively, that we live longer in a, in a good state. And the other is when people are sick. Yeah? So what, what could be the cause of entropy? Um, society is not synchronized. So what we have is burnout. What we have, and this shows a Gallup study uh, done for several years, the Gallup Engagement Index. And they're asking employees, are you engaged at work? So let me, let me do an exercise with you. What percentage of employees do you think say, we, we, I am engaged? I give you three options. 15%, 30%, and 50%. So who thinks 15% of the workforce is engaged? Raise your hand. Two, five. Who thinks it's 30%? Three, four, five, six. Who thinks it's 50? One. It's is that what they say? Or what they say. What, what people, what, what employees say? 50. You would say 90. OK. The result of this Gallup survey is 15% on a global scale. That means 85% of the workforce is not engaged or dramatically disengaged. So how can we? 
become more productive when 85% is not engaged. So, and even worse, in Western Europe, the people say there's only 10% engaged. And almost double, 19% say we are actively disengaged. Shitty colleagues, bad boss, lousy company. So how can you run a company where double of your engaged workforce is actively disengaged? So what, what I think is that this is the biggest obstacle for growth and productivity of the world economy. And the cause is moral deficits. Because when we don't have moral, we don't have values in the companies, we don't have principles in the companies, and we, we can't align and we make bad decisions. So how did we get there? Probably all of you know this, the long economic cycles, when we started out at the uh, steam engine. Uh, Back then, 85% of world population lived in extreme poverty. And each cycle had a technological basic innovation to create this, or to, 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 to make the next cycle a growth cycle. The last basic innovation was information technology. This happened in around 1970, at least. This is where this long cycle is, you know, unfolding, and it's still going on. So now we're at the brink for the next long economic cycle. And do we see a technological uh, innovation? Well, we rather have a technocratic paradigm. Is all that technology that's around really helping to move on in a meaningful and helpful way? Now let's take a closer look. The year 1970, this was the beginning of the fifth long cycle. Um, the world, or we as mankind, had footprint one. That means we were using exact the amount of renewable resources the world was, our planet was able to reproduce. I believe what those people who calculated it uh, did, and they did it right. In 1971, President Nixon signed the temporary suspension of Bretton Woods. So he took the US dollar off the gold standard. What was the consequence? They put the money press on and they're printing money since then, not only America, all around the globe. We're printing money to have more money around. So this opened the door for shareholder value. On the other hand, um, in 1972, we had the first climate conference, so the voices became louder about environment. So do we have an issue? Yes, we are meeting and we're discussing climate agreements and how fast we want to reduce it. So uh, the last result from, from COP20 in Rome was, uh, we want to make up what we did over the last 200 years. So we want to cut down emissions and carbon and everything to zero. That's where we started in 1800, more or less. Maybe difficult. Again, another point of view, I already said, 1970, we had footprint one. That means we had enough resources to feed the world without taking it from, the, from nature. And 21 is we need 1.7 planets. Okay, do we need to take it serious? Well, leave it up, but it's a fact that's discussed and it's there. And we can, we can see it and numbers are uh, uh, crunched. On the other hand, we still play the shareholder value game. Tesla is worth more than the biggest nine car makers in the world. Is Tesla, is, is, is this a sustainable technology? Can, is this the future of mobility? Maybe, but at least the story is great. And in one day, on one day he was 
uh, making more money than Mercedes market value was. Interesting. So, but is there hope? Yes, I, I think there's hope. Uh, two years ago, the 200 largest American companies committed to put purpose ahead of profit and to put their focus on value to customers. Is that new? No, it's not new, but they signed a treaty and we're watching them and especially America is watching them closely. But numbers show it could work. When we say that purpose is the preliminary to end up with more profit, a Harvard Columbia study shows figures, Quam Ferry shows figures. So it's good for the profit of companies, it's good for the engagement of people, and uh, as Harvard also found out, it's good for the long-term view for companies. So let me double down a bit on, on purpose. When we run companies by numbers only, and we you know, push people and, and figures and, and whatever we do with KPIs, we see that those companies over the long run get in trouble. And on the other hand, we see that people who create a purposeful strategy make better decisions and end up with better results. So what, what is purpose in the end doing? It connects the outside world with the inside. Because what's the purpose of a company? It's to create a customer. So we better know how to generate value for customers. That's where we need something to put out and say, that's our promise, that's our position, that's what we want you to remember about us, that you buy from us and not from our competitors. We need to deliver this kind of value, so we need to have an organization uh, and we need to have the right people to deliver the promised value, and we have to, uh, or we better capture value for the company. So we need processes, we need systems, uh, to, to, to generate money long term. So when we have purpose at the heart of a business strategy and make better decisions and find the right people and make them work in teams, we make better decisions. And then I think we don't have to ask about are we inclusive or not, we will make inclusive decisions in respect of society, of people, and nature. So what should we do in essence? Return to capitalism as it was the initial idea. So it's not the question is it inclusive or not, it's about long-term value, and that benefits all stakeholders, businesses, investors, employees, customers, governments, communities, and members of the society and the planet. We're working on this issue with customers since 20 years all around the globe with a big network and try to make a difference that way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the time consciousness. Please, the floor is to the audience. Are there any questions? Please, Aidan. So in the, in the recent debate about, about purpose, particularly around the time of the, the chief execs in the state, you know, coming out with the purpose and value statement, um, some of the backdrop to uh, Friedman's um, article around uh, shareholder value was brought out. And, you know, it, what, what, he, what he said was more subtle than just, you know, it's about maximizing profits. What he said is that if management, management and big companies control a lot of resources, and if you give them a goal other than profit, 
they have a lot of power then, and they can use it whatever way they want because they have a very broad range of things that they can now support. And he's worried that that was going to cause um, issues with, with, with freedom, but also issues around um, um, power and, um, and equality in the system. Because she, as we saw in the 70s and 80s before the MBO buyout, management in the States were using their money for their own purpose, was using shareholders' money for their own purpose. And that was the backdrop to his, his statement. And I, th I think the problem with this is, is that, is that you know, when you look at purpose like that, how do you restrict the power of management um, um, when, they've, when they can just say anything as part of their purpose? Um. Thank you, that's, that's a very good point because unfortunately Friedman is dead and he cannot help anymore. But what we see, and this is what I meant with the KPI thing, we're driving companies and people up and down the hill with key performance indicators. Too many and too many stupid ones. And that's the issue because when you say, how much more are we gonna do next year when you sit in an analyst meeting? Uh, um, I, I think we're going to do 15% more profit and 20% uh, more uh, revenue. So then you go home and say, hey guys, I just committed with the, in the analyst meeting. So now sit down and do it. So this leads to bad decisions. So what we need is long-term planning. What we need is an alignment of resources and a really calibration. What can a company do in a certain market segment? on the longer term and what do they want to stand for and this you know gives a company a clear focus what's their core business and where should they not be working in because when we say we want to grow we want ah there's a niche to grow ah there's another niche to grow oh we buy another company it's for growth's sake and i think that's a difficulty some can deal with it in a meaningful way and many can't and that's it Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh